Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. He is not here. He's not here. What's so revolutionary about an empty tomb? Actually, an empty tomb's quite an ordinary thing. The fact that the tomb is empty, actually, on its own, doesn't mean much. It could be that someone has taken the body. What is so revolutionary about an empty tomb? Well, I want to suggest to you the answer to that question is quite difficult to explain. I want to suggest to you uh, that I'm going to attempt to explain something to you. And I've tried to go to the best, most informative source to help us understand. You already know where I'm going, don't you, Lars? Yeah. (laughs) All right. The most informative source that I could find. Disney Pixar. Okay. So, I don't know uh, if... Do people recognise that group? So, you're familiar with these characters, are you? Some of you have had to watch it with grandchildren for, you know, again, can we watch it? Monsters, Inc., again, you know. Some of you uh, have only seen it recently. Look, I want to suggest to you that in this story are the elements that can help us understand... Why an empty tomb is revolutionary. Okay, so if you haven't seen, heard this story and need to know the plot, just tell me, uh, does anyone know who these guys are? Oh, sorry, I've got their names up there. doesn't help, does it? Mike Wazowski and James P. Sullivan. Um, Sully is a scarer. That's his job. He is a scarer. He works for Henry J. Waternoose. Now, Henry J. Waternoose is the uh, managing director of the energy company in, I'm going to say Monsters World. I'm sure it's got a different name than that. Uh, Anyway, he runs this company. uh, And this company is at the heart of the life of the community because without this company and the energy it produces, uh, they don't live full life. And so we remember how is the energy derived in this community? Through children's screaming. That's right. So basically, um, these guys, they're heading onto the scare floor in which they will find a door, a door into another world. A door that on the other side are those who are to be feared themselves. Children. Okay? The community in Monsters Land has a name. I don't know. Anyway, um, have understand that the other, these children, these human children, are toxic. That in fact, uh, they potentially, if you come in contact with them, could threaten your life. I wonder if you, you know, what's this? Code 3529. I don't even know if that's the number. I made it up. But that's the code. Um, uh, some of you will remember the famous scene where the monster comes back through the door feeling really proud with, of himself and they discover there's a sock on his back and they go into full lockdown where he, you know, uh, is showered and shaved and a bit embarrassed in the end. This is what they're afraid of. 
Um, it's actually kind of ironic that the child's name is Boo. And so this uh, is the setup in which this world, its life, is shaped around fear and death. What happens is they start to realise that fear is losing its effect. That in fact, to get the energy they need, they need more scare. They need more fear. And so, unbeknownst to the rest of the community, the corporation begin a plan to extract more fear. And the dastardly instrument has a great name. It's called the Fear Extractor. So, fear is losing its effectiveness. Those who have power, those who seek profit, seek to ensure themselves by means in which they use the, a sense of ultimate fear to extract from these children. So, this child makes her way into this world, from another world. This child is innocent. In fact, this child, you might say, is a perfect representation of what it means to be human. And she becomes the centre of the fear in that community. That they circle round and, and accuse her of being a danger to their very way of life and must be caught. In the meantime, she meets these two. These two go from fearing her to being her followers. I hope you're kind of making connections here at this point of time. Her disciples, her friend. And in doing so, what do they discover? Well, through death, or a figurative death, coming out the other side, they realise that instead of fear and death being the commodity on which they build their community, a commodity that requires competition and, and is a limited resource, they come to realise that in fact something is better. What is better? What works better than fear? What is something that is, we do not need to compete for and is, and is not in limited supply. What is it? Laughter, joy, life. Okay. Uh, maybe Disney Pixar are not the first to think about this. Some of you have heard me talk about, and I know John Roundhill at a sermon in this place in the last couple of years, talked about a fellow called René Girard. René Girard is a French anthropologist. He's a, he's a fellow who has uh, researched the ways in which we human beings create community, connectedness, life. And his suggestion uh, is that we human beings, again and again, use death to create connectedness and community. He calls it the scapegoating mechanism. Um, think of witch hunts, okay? Witch hunts is a situation where in a community there is a controversy and so uh, a community will select a person who they can demonise by calling a witch and place all the controversy on their shoulders, kill them and walk away feeling better. It's called, a, it's called the scapegoat mechanism. And I want to suggest to you that we are so used to in our lives the, I, this method of creating community, we're not even aware we're doing it ourselves. 
okay? So let me give you some examples of the ways in which we use this mechanism. Um, and can I say, I want to say up front, before you hear differently, I'm not saying this mechanism is good or bad, okay? Uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I am saying sometimes it's used in a way which is destructive. So let's just think about basically every national holiday that we know. Bastille Day. American Independence Day. Do you want me to go on? <laughs> they are all occasions in which we mark a battle in which people die. And we use that to celebrate and make connectedness for a community. Okay? That's one example. I've already told you about um, a witch hunt. Uh, how about a royal funeral? Did you watch a royal funeral this year? Did you see the way in which, as community, we gather around a body and create connectedness? What about statues in King George Square? What are they there for? Well, someone well-known has died. We put up a statue. We kind of gather around it so we can tell a story and create connectedness. Do you want me to still go on? <laughs> Our prison system is based on a metaphorical death. We arrest people. We put them in a metaphorical place so that we might feel better and connected. Money. Money. We transact money, it's kind of a metaphorical death. I'm giving you something. It's a little death of mine, so that I can get something from you. The thing about every single one of these things is the power that we use fades. Inflation is necessary because the power of money diminishes and you actually need more and more for the same effect. Okay? The war in Ukraine. A leader of a nation starts feeling his power dissipating. So what is the human way of increasing power and connectedness? Death. Create some bodies and get people to gather around it. So what you do is you point at another nation and you say you dehumanise the leaders and people of that nation by saying they're all Nazis and you question their human sexuality. So when you bomb them, it doesn't feel so bad. But what happens if that fear is not enough? You have to create more bodies. So you enlist 300,000 people of your own nation to go and fight and create more bodies on which you can create community and hopefully keep your power. We, as humans, for better or for worse, use death we gather around death to create connectedness, to create community. So what's so revolutionary about an empty tomb? What's so great about an empty tomb? Well, let's just think about what's happened here. Rome, the force and power in the first century in which the story occurs, maintains their rule, what they call the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. How? 
by the use of death. We're going to have peace and we're going to have it at the end of a sword. And in fact, if you're not going to be peaceful, we're going to nail you to a cross and pop you up there so the rest of the population can look at the crosses appearing on the hill. In that context, a human enters our world. A human that we've come to know as, a, as the true human, the perfection of human. A human that we've come to know reveals exactly the character and person of God. That person becomes the becomes the person on which an accusation is made. A controversy swirls. He's tried and placed on a cross. And the world in which he has come in gathers up all the possible fear, chaos and evil and pours it out upon him. Such that they hope that in that death, you know, it's better that one man should die. That they will be able to maintain their position, their power and create connectedness in their community. What's so revolutionary about an empty tomb? There is no body to gather around. If they wanted to use death, then they need a body. Our story says that even his own disciples, the women, are making their way to the tomb, perhaps to gather around the body. And when they get there, he is not there. So what do you do if the only way we know to create community is to gather around death? What do you do when there is no body? You have to find a way to create connectedness, not around death, but around life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I have come so they might have life and have it abundantly. This is the revolution. It says that in God, there is a way for abundant life that does not require competition and that is not limited. A way in which we create life with commodities of love, forgiveness, justice, peace and hope that do not and will not run out. We have to gather around life and not death. Actually, even though I say there is no body, there is a body. It just so happens that it's alive. We are called to gather around a body. A body that is resurrected. A body that is alive. And that requires us to challenge the ways in which this world's evil and chaos seems to work. To gather around the resurrected body of Christ. How will we do that? Well, in a moment, I'm going to do what is one of the most favourite things I do all year. I'm going to splash you with water. We are going to renew our baptismal vows. The central thing in our Christian life that calls us to mission and ministry. That calls us through death to life. I'm going to invite you to renew them. To gather around 
and renew ourselves to the life of Christ. And then we're going to gather, gather around the meal. A body. The body and blood of Christ. Jesus, what, was, what was the one thing that Jesus said you should do? What's the, he says, you know, when I'm gone, how will you create community? Have a meal together. A meal that reminds us of the body that is resurrected. We are the body of Christ. Thank you. We say it every Sunday. We don't say, one day if we're really good, we might be the body of Christ. We don't say, if you try really hard and you work long at it, we could become the body of Christ. We say we are the body of Christ. We say that we have become that body which we are called to gather around and gather the world around so that we might create connection one with another, being with God, being with each other, being with the community around us, that we might gather around life and not death. He is not here. It is a call to go and find where that life is and to use it to bring abundant life. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.